Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, boa madrugada, aonde você estiver. Eu sou o Thiago Luiz Tiquete. Sejam bem-vindos ao canal Investigação OVNI. Olá pessoal, e hoje eu trago para vocês mais uma entrevista inédita e exclusiva que você só encontra aqui, aqui no canal Investigação OVNI. A minha convidada de hoje é a neozelandesa Suzy Hamsen, pesquisadora há muito tempo, teve experiências de abdução lá nos anos de 1990. Ela vai contar para a gente essas experiências, vai contar também a sua a, a pesquisa com relação a esse fenômeno e como ela tem ajudado a pessoas a abduzidos a também buscar respostas. Suzy foi muito importante também no desacobertamento de arquivos na Nova Zelândia. Então vem comigo nessa entrevista inédita e exclusiva com a Suzy Hamsey, direto da Nova Zelândia. Mas antes de começarmos, tenho um lembrete para vocês. O canal Investigação Obra tem sempre três vídeos novos por semana. Toda segunda, toda quarta e toda sexta. Vídeos novos e estreias para você. E para não perder nada, o que você tem que fazer? São quatro passos simples. O primeiro, se inscreva no canal. O segundo, marque o um lembrete, que é aquele sininho que fica ali no YouTube. O terceiro, dê um like, mas assim, curta todos os vídeos do canal. São centenas de vídeos. E por fim, deixe seu comentário. Dessa forma, o YouTube vai entender que você é uma conta ativa, que está sempre aqui no, no YouTube e gostando do canal e sempre que tiver um vídeo novo, uma estreia, você vai ser avisado e não vai perder nada. Dito isso, vamos então para a entrevista inédita, exclusiva, direto da Nova Zelândia, com Suzy Hansen. Well, Suzy, thank you very much to be here in my channel. Uh, it's a very pleasure for me to have you here and uh, because I study a little about you and uh, I, I read some papers and interviews that you make about your research and facts of your life. I mean, ufology, facts of, of, of ufology <laughs> in your life. So I have questions here and uh, I'd like to ask you. And, and it's very interesting because it's the first time that uh, I interview on uh, abductee. The first oh, time. Okay. In, And I read and, and I read the, the papers that I saw, watch your interviews, and whoa, it's amazing. Well, firstly, I, I'm not. I don't call myself an abductee. I call myself an experiencer because my experiences were positive, and I uh, never felt forced or anything like that. So, um, uh, I I don't use the term abductee. It's just like the 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 contactee in the 1670s, 1780s. They they were invited to to join the ship or, or make contact mm. with the, the aliens, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, well, your interest in ufology was sparked, let's say, uh, by something that happened to you just over 20 years ago. Could <laughs> you tell longer, us what happened? A little longer than <laughs> <laughs> But well, I think when, when you figure out, when, when you figure out. <laughs> Yeah, um, Can you tell your experience? Yeah, actually there were two events in my life that really um, triggered my interest, not only in space, but in um, uh, ufology and contact field. So the first event was when I was eight years old and, um, and my entire family and some of the neighbours in the street I was living in, uh, we saw a UFO over a series of hills near where I lived, maybe about 25 kilometres away. And so this was in the mid 60s and it appeared as a, a long, narrow, orange bar of light, extremely bright and kind of flaring like this in the night sky. Um, but it was hanging stationary for about an hour and a half. Uh, so a lot of people saw it all over the district where we were living in and further afield. And then it moved off down the central North Island where that night it was sighted by hundreds of people and it appeared in our national newspaper, not a photo, of course, but a write-up about it. So that was the first thing that really set me thinking about um, 
well, what was it? If it wasn't a UFO, I mean, it wasn't a helicopter, sorry. It wasn't an aircraft. It wasn't um, a, a natural anomaly. So it had to be something that was being flown by someone. So that opened my mind at an early age to these kinds of possibilities and an interest in space. But when I was uh, 20 and a young teacher, I was traveling on a lonely rural country road and it was about 4.30 in the afternoon in autumn. So it was very sunny and, uh, you know, the fields looked beautiful and golden in the sunlight and uh, it was it was broad daylight. And we saw my flatmate and I saw a light appear over the hills ahead of us. Then they clicked out and they appeared next to us clicked out again and this went on several times before they seemed to disappear but in actual fact they'd gone around behind us completely unseen and this light uh, came up behind us and lifted my car off the road um, so there was a, a, a terrifying few moments where uh, the light came over the car it was extremely bright there was a loud grinding noise and um, and I saw my flatmate had lost consciousness, was no longer driving the car. I felt the car lifted off the road and uh, we had 90 minutes missing time. I must have passed out or been somehow switched off because um, the next thing I remember, it was, um, it was pitch black. The car appeared to be floating and, um, and it was somehow lowered down onto the road and... Um, and we, we continued our journey in complete confusion, absolute fear of what had happened and arrived home at our flat um, an hour and a half late. So um, it took me quite some time to, um, to actually come to terms with this and, and um, assimilate it into my life. And it catapulted me headlong into sighting and contact research in New Zealand. Sorry, uh, and and uh, and I read that you had uh, this experience since you were a child. Yes. Uh, how did you figure it out? How how did you do you discover that? Well, uh, do you have some kind of invisible friends or 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 uh, uh, be afraid of owls or or lights? How how did you come up 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 of to you? No, I didn't. I didn't have any of those. Um childhood fears that that many experiences talk about i just had memory of um these silhouettes these kind of golden glowing silhouettes in my bedroom at night there were always three and um, my mother gave me various uh, possible explanations of what they were to try to appease me as a child she probably thought i was going to be frightened i wasn't frightened i felt as if these things whatever they were that appeared in my room and talked to me obviously telepathically um i had no fear of them in fact i felt an overwhelming love for them and um they would tell me that they were taking me somewhere that i was helping them in some way and uh and i wouldn't remember anymore until um that that brought me back and probably asked me to get into bed and then uh, I would I would be aware of them saying goodbye and I would immediately go to sleep. So um, it took, I had these dreamlike memories of as a child of being in a very white room with other strange looking children, both human and something else. They were unusual, but at the same time, because I'd been seeing them throughout childhood, obviously they were usual to me. So it didn't uh, phase me in any way. I, my mother tried to convince me these were just dreams, but um, they were quite vivid. I remembered being taught things to do with my mind, um, being able to lift things off the floor with my mind, being taught by the other children to do all kinds of things with objects and, and with uh, consciousness. So um, it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that I began to piece this together when I began as an adult to experience similar things and these memories began to flood back from childhood and I realized that I was dealing with the same thing and so the fear that was beginning to build up as an adult quickly dissipated because I realized that these were the the beings or the entities that 
that I had um, communicated with in childhood and that I wasn't harmed. And um, But it still took some years um, as a young mother, having had a family, it still took some time for me to assimilate really what was happening and begin to um, live with it, I guess, because uh, New Zealand is a faraway country with a tiny population. And in those days, nobody knew about this sort of thing. There were no books coming into New Zealand at that time on, on contact or abduction. So it wasn't until those books by John Mack, um, Bud Hopkins and others started coming into New Zealand that uh, that I really felt like I wasn't alone anymore. And I began to meet other New Zealanders at that stage in the 70s uh, who, who'd experienced similar. Well, you, you are a mother, right? You, you have kids. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, you, don't you be afraid that the same thing happens to them um, well, I don't, I don't feel fearful about it. So I don't have it. I know that nothing untoward or negative has happened to me. So I'm not afraid for my children. I know that my eldest son has had experiences and, uh, but he's busy getting on with his life and he's not delving into them. He has some memories that are quite minimal and maybe, um, deeper memories will come out but really that's for him to, that's part of his life and I don't interfere with that. I brought my children up um, from childhood not knowing what was happening to me. I wanted them to have ordinary childhoods, which they did, you know, playing sport, doing all the things that children do. And I didn't burden them with uh, the kinds of experiences that I was ha having, although on occasions they did witness things. So they, they witnessed on... Uh, one occasion, uh, seeing a sighting a UFO at a remote beach coming out of the water. So um, these things are part of their life, but I don't impose it on them. And I don't have concerns about um, their safety with, in regard to ET. I'd be more concerned about their safety with some humans than anything else. Well, it's amazing. Well, I, I would be very, very scared. <laughs> I have to confess you, but you know. Well, you have to realize that if this thing has been happening all your life, um, that's your life. That's what you're used to. That's what you deal with. Um, so, you know, uh, to other people hearing about this, it may seem strange or it may be frightening. But if this has been the life you've led, then you've assimilated it into your life. And, and that's just the way that it is. Yeah, you have to deal with that, right? Uh, to live, to have a normal life, of course. Well, uh, your case uh, was researched by Dr. Rudy Child, astrophysics Child, Child astrophysics emeritus of uh, Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. How did he get interested in your case? Well, uh, Rudy was a good friend of the late Dr. John Mack, so he already had an interest not only in UFOs as an astrophysicist and cosmologist, but um, he'd sat for many hours with, with uh, Dr. Mack and talked about these things over the years. So um, I saw Dr. Schill talking about black holes and quasars on a, on a video, and um, and uh, I instantly felt as if I knew him, as if I knew him really well, and that I needed to contact him for some reason. So this was a real spur of the moment thing. I actually spent some time trying to get in touch with him using old email addresses and a bit of a paper chase to find him. And um, and I wrote him this long email and I, I actually didn't expect, knowing that he was a very busy man um, involved in a lot of research, I didn't expect that he would answer and experience her, but he did. And uh, he, he wrote me a lovely email and said, I'm very interested in what you've said. And I see that you're writing a book. So would you like to send me some chapters? How about the first couple of chapters? So I sent those and he said, oh, yes, this, this all sounds, this sounds very familiar. You know, I've talked a lot about this with Dr. John Mack. So um, send me a few more. So uh, he sent me, I sent him some more and he, um, offered to assist me understanding the scientific side of what I was talking about because I'm not a scientist and uh, I didn't really have a clue of the ramifications of what I was uh, writing about in terms of science. So he very kindly offered to help me. 
And at some point, um, we exchanged a lot of emails and Skype sessions. And at some point, he said to me, now send me some chapters you think are really going to throw me that might stretch my, my ability to accept it. So I sent him two chapters that, uh, you know, were really in depth and very unusual, the experiences. And he came back to me and said, in terms of physics, these are the chapters I understand the most and the best. So at that point, he asked me if, if it would be right if he became a part of the book. Instead of trying to advise me, he would write scientific epilogue commentary and put some footnotes throughout the book. And I was very grateful for his assistance because he was able to explain some things a great deal better than I would have been able to. You, you had uh, the opportunity to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rudy with you. He helped you. Do you think that it's important to contactees or, and, and, and abductees have this kind of help? Because I think that many, many people probably had passed this, uh, uh, passing through this, this experience, but uh, keep the thing to them because they have nobody to talk, nobody mm -hmm. to help. What do you think? Do, do, do you think that the professionals had, must, must have more attention to these patients? Let's, let's talk, let's say patients. Well, um, and I've been in this field contact and UFO sighting research for 47 years now. And um, at the beginning, there was there were very few people to speak to, certainly not in New Zealand. And um, I guess there were a lot of other, other countries the same. There were people in the States mainly um, and a few other people dotted around the world. But um, what has happened really is that... Um, a lot of researchers have got involved in this field and I have noticed in the last 10 to 15 years that a lot of researchers are really um, theorizing. They don't know the answers to a lot of things or they have pet theories about things that they expand on um, and they kind, kind of um, pick out a bit of information here and a bit there that might fit their theory and then they tack it all together and they present this theory as fact. And that really deeply concerns me both as an experiencer and as a researcher and a person who supports experiencers and abductees myself. Um, I think we need to bring some honesty back to the contact field and, um, and we need to have more experiencers who are, are happy in their skin as an experiencer, shall I say, such as I am and many others, um, experiencers really need to support experiencers. Having said that, I think that there is a place for professionals to, uh, to also join the arena. And unfortunately, a lot of the researchers in the field at present are not um, professionals. And, and that really is uh, letting things down a bit, letting the side down. Um, but over the years, I have seen more and more psychologists um, become involved, scientists in a whole multitude of fields be have become involved in the subject. And I often hear people say, oh, there's not enough scientists researching this. But in fact, there are many scientists quietly researching this. They just don't want to put their name out there to the subject because they know that uh, the ridicule that it can exist in certain uh, professional disciplines and um, they're aware of, of losing grants, et cetera. But that doesn't mean to say that they are not interested in and not addressing the subject quietly. Well, uh, I still have these experiences. They're still in contact with you. And uh, what are the most striking details, the episode of your experience? Tell us the most striking. Well, when you remember, wow, this is, this was wild. This was amazing. Um, are you talking about my experiences or those that are reported to me by other people? About your experience, your okay. experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, on one occasion, I was taken into a room with seven other humans and, um, and there were quite a number of entities there. There were greys and other mixed species there as well. The first thing I noticed was that when we walked into this room, um, we were told that this room would now expand. Um, now, don't ask me, Thiago, how they do that. 
Um, I have seen tiny UFOs that I've thought, well, how are we ever going to get inside that? But the moment you step through the little doorway, it expands and there's this huge space beyond there. Um, many, many experiencers report this. On this occasion, we went into this room that seemed to expand, so the walls seemed to move away until we were in this very large white space. And um, we were then told that we, we were invited to let go of all our preconceived ideas about our body and see if we could just uh, let our body disintegrate. Now, we were all quite shocked by this. So we were told, well, we'll show you how it's done. So the greys and species present in the room, they just quietly um, stood there in front of us and, and it was like a mist began to come off their body and their entire body fragmented into a coloured or a dust, I can put it that way. Um, and each of them took on a colour. So we had all these different colours that moved up um, and blended in, in the air. And then they said to us, we can reform ourselves however we like. And they invited us to provide in our mind an image of something that we want, would like them to create. So they created various different objects that popped into our minds while we were watching this and they formed those shapes in the air. And they continued inviting us to, to let our consciousness take over and let our consciousness become in control of the physical body. Um, and although the experience was very profound, all of us ended up in tears because the, the amount of um, love that was being projected towards us was completely overwhelming, um, such as I've never experienced in my life. We all think we love our husband or our wife or our children, but this was just something ultimately different. Um, none of us were able to let our consciousness take over and and disintegrate our body but uh, and they eventually came back into their form um so there were a number of aspects to this which i went into great detail about in the chapter in my book and this was one of the chapters that i presented to doc Schild, who he had a great deal to say about this one so that's one of the ones and one other one which i won't go into in great detail but uh, I was in a small craft that, where I was told that to take me back from the northern hemisphere where I was, uh, where they'd taken me, to take me back to where I lived in the southern hemisphere, they were going to pass through the planet. And when they said that, um, my stomach just felt as if it had dropped to the floor because I felt this instant terror of the craft smashing into the planet and disintegrating I was going to be killed or <clears throat> we were going to be attempting to pass through lava and magma or whatever and they assured me no it's nothing like that um, they changed they said we will change the phase of the craft so the craft takes on some other uh, existence if I can put it that way or, or phase or vibration or frequency and it jumps out of the present reality and it runs alongside it in some other dimensional reality and then it jumps back again. This was how it, is, it was described to me. And during that um, process, the craft would actually pass through the, the space that the planet occupies. So in effect, it would pass through the planet. Um, and that was quite an experience and uh, I wrote quite a lot about that in my book and that was the other chapter that Dr. Schultz found intriguing and he picked up on a lot of the things that I described, how there was moments of blackness at certain stages, how we started off by going out right out to the outer atmosphere of our planet and seeing the curvature of the earth and, and the colour of it and um, the, the feeling of... Um, overwhelming sadness looking down at the planet because as we withdrew from the planet it just became took on this beautiful um vista and so all of the wars and all of the disease and the hardship and and sorrow just disappeared in, into this image in my mind and um and i described the the um 
spiral motion that I could see on the screen as we approach the planet, etc. So all of these um, aspects of physics, Dr. Schild was able to understand what was possibly happening um, to the craft at that time. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, where, where, where they come from? Do you know the the only graves that do the the abduction contactee or or the the experiences? They they are only the one race, only the graves. And where do they come from? Well, um, uh, just addressing your your last statement first. Um, on the craft that I've been on, and I've been on some very large ones like cities. And I've been to underground bases as well. And um, the entities that we've seen there, it's a whole variety of them working together. And I described this uh, positive agenda that they're carrying out um, where a number of species are involved. The greys tend to be the front, the front people because they've got certain skills uh, in relation to this. And that's why they are the ones that most experiencers or abductees see. But having said that, there are there are a number of, of other species in the background on the craft doing various things, particularly in the medical side of, of the crafts, the medical facilities that they have, what we would call medical or healing. Um, and the scientists, there, there are a number of different species um, that, that are seen there. So um, most people comment on the greys because that's the one that they see when they're taken on board craft to be uh, take part in activities or to be medically examined or whatever um i have asked the greys where they come from and they said that they no longer have a, a home base on a planet that they are spacefarers they have these very large craft where they produce what they need as to whether they uh, go home to some particular place i don't know um, but that this is how they travel. They go to, they, I was told, they go to wherever they are needed. And at this point in time, um, they've shown up on our planet because the need is great. And much of that need relates to our, our nuclear um, capabilities that they are concerned about. And a large number of experiences will, will tell you that, that they've been told the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I heard that. Well, in your book, the, the dual soul connection with uh, I think Dr. Rudy is, is joining oh, with you in this book. Yeah. Um, you address issues such as alien culture, uh, spiritually and uh, consciousness alongside scientific concepts of uh, advanced physics and consciousness organic technology. What would be uh, 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 the alien culture look like? Um, well, when I was quite young, um, at tw the age of 12, I've written about in a book, but at other times too, and as an adult, I've been taken into the what I call the grey quarters on the craft where, um, where they live. So a lot of the uh, areas of large craft where humans are taken, they are purpose-built for humans because um, we tend to be... We tend to be a lot taller than most of the greys, not all of them, but they are purpose built with uh, what I call bridging technology that humans are able to use and understand. And when when you go into the grey quarters, I described their corridors as more like um, rounded tunnels, really, I guess, uh, that thus the structure of the rooms and everything, a lot of the features about them were very different from the rest of the craft where humans are taken. Um, I have seen them preparing something that they ingest as a as sustenance. So I saw a group of greys preparing that in a room. I've also seen um, a piece of technology that the virtual, which I nicknamed the virtual reality chair, and that was long. You know, I nicknamed it that when I was an adult, but I saw it long before we even had that kind of terminology. I saw it and could see what it could do. So this is a form of recreation for them where they can transport themselves to almost anywhere through augmented reality um, and, and study other planets or other existences and environments through this um, chair that they sit in that, that basically takes their consciousness there and provides sound and, and smell and all of the other senses that go with it. Um, 
So their culture is very clockwork, if I can put it that way. Their life on the craft is very um, uh, dependent on on completing certain tasks within a short space of time, particularly with humans. If if in the in decades gone by they were taken on board the craft physically, that doesn't happen as much now. But when they were taken on board craft, there was a lot involved in their transportation, getting them on and off the craft, transporting them to larger craft where activities or investigations took place, etc., and getting them back again. So um, their culture is is very tied to uh, management, management in, in every sense of the word. And they have what has been labelled by a lot of experiencers as a hive mind. So they are able to tap into each other, um, understand each other. Um, and often when, when you are formulating a question in your mind, they are already answering it telepathically. So um, they are picking up on your telepathy long before you've actually um, formulated the question properly. They are already picking up on all of the thought processes that lead up to that in, in a split second. Um, they're masters of telepathy. They're masters of being able to uh, do extraordinary things with the mind, both with um, operating technology, but also uh, in uh, conveying information to you. And I write about this in depth in the book about the different ways that modes of telepathy that they use. In particular, I was fascinated from an early age with the fact that they can actually shut you out of some telepathy if they want to. So if there's several of them standing there and several humans and they want to close a per person off from perceiving what, what they are sending telepathically, they can do that. How that they do that, I have no idea. But these are all things that they assure experiencers humans will learn to do in the future. Yeah, I hope so. And I believe that's, that's, that's well. Well, I, I heard from since uh, I started to read about the UFO that uh, the greys were clones. They have no feelings. They have no, no nothing. Just do what they have, what, what they have to do and leave it. Uh, what a, do they believe in, 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 in the same God that we do? They have some uh, uh, spiritually or, or some religion that make uh, make them a little bit just like us? Well, um, you know, I, I often hear experiences, some experiences, not all, but some experiences um, and um, researchers talking about the first aspect that you mentioned, and that is, oh, they're clones and they, they have no sense of humor, etc. But I've never found them like that, and I know hundreds of experiencers who've never found them like that. Also, um, from my experience, they have a very good sense of humor, which makes them very similar to us, and um, they have emotions. Um, what we have to remember is that we have a very mobile face and body. Uh, their body is probably a lot stiffer, and because they have become used to using telepathy um, as their mode of communication. They no longer need the facial expressions and the body mannerisms that we automatically use every day when we're speaking. We wave our hands around, we change our, our facial expressions with our, our um, eyes and our mouth and our, the muscles of our face. Um, but because they're conveying everything telepathically, they don't need to do that anymore. So um, what, what many humans don't perceive when they're taken on the craft, especially if they're fearful, um, that immediately cuts them off from the kind of communi telepathic communication that's common on, commonly used on the craft. So um, if you're afraid and you're fighting back or whatever, um, you're not going to pick up or perceive or hear what they are saying to you telepathically. So all you see is a blank, bland face and you're going to think it's a clone or that it is unkind or um, has no feelings or emotions. But uh, the, the greys that I've and species I've had contact with that nothing could be further from the truth um, and and I've known that since since early childhood um, in terms of God well God is our concept um, 
what the ETs talk about is the source, and they greatly love and respect this aspect of consciousness, this um, this overriding power of good and love and compassion. And they they refer to have referred to it to me as a source and to many other experiencers. And um, I write about some some memories I had that that were pre-birth, and I was actually talking to another experiencer on Skype the other day about their experience of recalling something pre-birth as well. So that's very interesting. And a lot of experiencers have these kinds of memories. And in that memory, I was with um, ETs and and uh, souls, balls of light, but also spirit forms. So humans who had once been incarnated on the planet and are now in what we refer to as the spirit realm. And they were all working uh, with what I would refer to as the God force or what the ETs call the source. Um, and so I believe that uh, from my experience anyway, that they greatly revere and adhere to this, this um, source love. And many experiencers talk about the overwhelming feelings of love that have been conveyed to them by the ETs. There are those who don't report that. And while I respect their experiences, I, I feel that either they have had experiences with different species, because let's face it, we don't know how many species are out there who may be, look very similar and have similar technology. Um, but these are things that hopefully we will discover in the future. And maybe one day, if this planet ever has open contact with ET, um, these are some of the questions that will be answered. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Well, uh, Dr. David Jacobs have a, a book calling Walking Among Us, the Alien Plan to Control the Humanity. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that subject. And yeah. uh, what do you think about that? They, their intention, their, their agenda is that to, 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 to uh, uh, control the humanity? Well, Thiago, they have phenomenal um, ability to, to um, control humans in different ways should they wish to. And certainly when people are being transported um, on and off craft, they sometimes use those mechanisms. Um, for example, uh, a humming sound is often heard that kind of acts as a sedation. So people are not afraid or they're quiet or they, they um, move quickly to to um wherever they're supposed to be so there are they have these phenomenal abilities they also have phenomenal technology so um why on earth would they need to take control of humanity and if they wanted to take control of humanity they could have done it hundreds or thousands of years ago because i think there's ample research coming to light now ancient research, ancient texts, cave drawings, you name it, that indicates that there have been these uh, beings of, of light or beings of superior technology and abilities that have been visiting us for a long time. So um, if they wanted to take over our planet, even those who've visited more recently could do it in the blink of an eye, but they haven't. Because I believe what they are here for is their concern for the direction that humanity is taking, their concern for what we are doing to our planet, and their concern that if we blow ourselves up or expose humanity to certain technology like nuclear warfare, etc., that will eventually affect them. And I've written an entire chapter about that in my book. Um, called the Galaxy Screen, um, where I was shown the explosions that took place in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the effect that this had going out into our solar system and way beyond out into space. So um, they're here to help us change humanity from within. I don't think they're here to, to tell us what to do, or they would have landed on, on the White House lawn or some other government's lawn a very long time ago and started making rules, but they haven't. They are taking humanity on board craft, teaching us things, giving us tools, giving us information, uh, showing us what they have got that would be very beneficial to humanity should we learn to behave ourselves better so that we can have open contact with them. 
And I think that if they wanted to take us over, um, it would have been done long before now. I agree with you. They want, if they want to destroy us, to destroy uh, us or control us, they could be do, do that, uh, done that years ago. But uh, do you believe that they create create us uh, genet genetically or alter it, change it, or DNA in some way to to us to look like we are now? Well, that's entirely possible. Um, I don't I don't know enough about what has been done over thousands of years on the planet, but it's possible that they have um, intervened and contributed to our evolution along the way. And I think that they are contributing, well, I know they're contributing to our, our evolution now um, in terms of educating us um, on board craft and providing scientists with skills. And I have seen large groups of scientists on board craft being given um, downloads of material that will come to the fore in the future, come into their consciousness. And um, and so I think that there will be a lot of changes happening on the planet very quickly over time from now on. But we are at a very crucial point um, in time at the moment. Most experiencers or many experiencers will tell you that they've been told that their, their genes have been altered. Um, I have been told that. I don't know in what way it's been altered, but I do know that I was told um, that in order for my physical body to uh, to take on the soul that wished to enter it, to lead this life as Susie Hansen, that certain modifications had to be made. Um, how that can be proven, I don't know. Perhaps we will be able to prove that in the future, but... Um, but certainly, uh, I think that they have the capability, and I've seen the capability on board craft of them genetically e engineering different species. And um, I've called that the chapter I wrote on that seeding planets, where they showed me these um, tube like tanks with various um, species growing inside them that they would eventually seed onto planets that were just beginning to form life and it's entirely possible that happened on our planet but we don't have enough answers for that at present um, okay okay well uh, you you are not uh, an abductee you are uh, experience uh, many people say that well i want to be abducted and i always say no don't want it never what would you say to people that <laughs> tell you well I, I would like to be an abducted well look Thiago if I had a dollar for every time someone has said that to me I'd be, <laughs> I'd be quite wealthy now um yes there's there are a lot of people I think who um maybe fantasize about uh, um what it is like to have these kinds of experiences but I can assure you that although my experiences have been positive there have been times when I was, as an adult, trying to assimilate this into my life and, and make sense of it, uh, there were times when it was quite terrifying because I did have concerns about my children, not that they would be harmed, but would they come, if they were taken on board, would they come back? Um, you know, those kinds of fears, fears that seem irrational but, but actually are quite rational for a person to consider under those circumstances. So... Um, Really, uh, a lot of experiences, I think, are quite lonely because we we sometimes just don't feel as if we fit in a lot of situations. And many experiences talk about how they have deep concerns about animals, uh, about children, about uh, the environment, the planet, our ecology, what's our food, what goes in it, what is what we're doing to each other, what humanity is doing in terms of wars. All of these kinds of things are far more important to them than than many of the other interests that their peers have in life, you know, um, that seem superficial when you put them alongside these kinds of interests and concerns. And, of course, you don't have to be an experiencer to have those kinds of concerns about the planet and what is happening. You know, many people feel that way, I'm sure. But um, you experience... Um, 
different sensory perceptions. You experience um, precognition and telepathy and, and seeing auras and all those kinds of things, which from early childhood can be quite isolating until you learn how to manage it in your life, if I can put it that way. So to people who have these desires that, that they want to, you know, go and see what it's like on a, on a craft, I would say, be a good person, lead your life well, do everything you can for the planet and your family and your friends, um, have as, as much positive impact as you have, can have. But, um, you know, aspiring to something like that uh, it has a lot of things attached to it that can take a lifetime to work through. Well, uh, do you think that some ra alien race living among us in, your, in our planet? Um, that's possible. We've, uh, I don't know any factual details about that, but um, a, lot of pe a lot of people have talked about that. A lot of researchers talk about it. Some experiencers talk about it. Um, many mediums, in fact, and clairvoyants talk about... Um, creatures and entities that they have seen that that are not what you would normally see from the spirit world if i can put it that way so they're aware of these other um other entities that are are a part of the existence around our planet so our vision or our perception is quite narrow really um and we are discovering more and more uh, things about our energy field for example um and our senses so it's entirely possible that as we evolve spiritually um, and as we evolve as humans and our understanding of consciousness and what it is and what we can do with it expands, it stands to reason that we may be able to see or perceive other entities or other species that are associated with our planet. We may not be the only hosts on this planet. There may be others. Um, but certainly at present, um, most many of us are dealing with uh, entities or species that come from elsewhere, so visitors to our planet, not part of the planet. Well, just to finish our interview, what's new about your research? What's your plans from the present and for the future? Well, as you know, I'm involved with ISA, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research, and I ha also have my own organization in New Zealand, um, you Focus NZ, and I have a website called Communicator Link through which I and several other colleagues um, communicate with experiencers and abductees worldwide and, and talk to them about their experiences and share information. So for me, um, my concentration at present is um, assisting ISA in our, in our establishment and foundation. We've only just launched um, a few months ago, so we're still a very new organisation, uh, and keeping my own organisations going in New Zealand. But personally, um, I'm trying to find the time at the moment to write my second book, um, it may be a little bit controversial because it presents information that's a little different to some, how some contact researchers are presenting information to humanity. So, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. But uh, that's what I'm doing is working on my second book. Well, I would like, I would like to read this book. I just purchased your, your, your book. I hope to receive it in next month. And we are colleague on ICER. I'm, I'm, I'm on ISA yes. too. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, I'd like to thank you very much to be here with us, I, I think. And I, I will leave all the links for your, your supporting page and, and websites. I will put all the links in the description of this video. And so thank you very much for your time. I think the, 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 the my Brazilian audience, we're gonna love it because they're very, interesting interesting effects that we never heard before so it's very import, important to us uh to listen this from a person that had this experience and probably we will have some brazilian getting in touch with you asking it'll be great <laughs> 
Thank you, Thiago. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you this morning and to your audience. And yes, I look forward to hearing from anyone who would like to contact me. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope you can chat more in a new videos in the future. Thank you very thank much, Susie. Thanks, Thiago.